Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Smart Start Weight Loss Program. I am so excited to be here today to present this information that is really a compilation of over 30 years experience working with patients to optimize their health. And a huge part of that has been to help with improving body composition. I'm Dr. Adria Rothfeld. I'm a chiropractor. I have a master's degree in clinical nutrition and also a certified nutrition specialist. And I'm presenting this program with Julian Ribinek. He is the health coach for the Nutritional Wellness Center. And he's also a nutritionist who specializes in fitness and really helping people achieve their goals for a healthy lifestyle. So let's start with question number one. Is this your first attempt at weight loss? And unfortunately, even without knowing everybody who's on this call, I am a little pessimistic about the answer to this question and I'm not basing it on knowing any of you. I'm basing it really on the fact that the statistics are alarming. 95% of dieters are going to gain back the weight they lost in two years or less and many will gain back even more than they started with. Obesity rates in America for adults is really getting up to close to 50%, which is staggering. Why is that? What is going on? Why are we having such bad luck with this when the science is pretty evidentiary and compelling and it's really evolved? So we should be more instead of less successful. Well, what happens when the diets really don't, don't match the science and when people severely restrict their calories? One thing that happens is metabolism slows down instead of speeding up. And if that's the case, and if you're not getting the right macronutrients, you don't wanna lose muscle instead of build muscle. You're gonna feel tired because you're malnourished. It's going to affect your brain chemistry, which is something I'm going to talk about in detail. Blood sugar gets impacted adversely if we're not eating in a balanced fashion. And the thyroid will slow down. Thyroid governs metabolic rate. So what happens is if the thyroid senses that you're not getting enough, it's gonna slow things down instead of speeding them up. And that's not what we wanna do. So what are we doing wrong? Well. Let's talk about what we need to do right. A successful program is going to do all of the following, which is what we've tried to incorporate in our Smart Start program. There's personalization, one size fits nobody. So we need to match your goals, your body composition, and you need support. Let's face it, everyone needs a little boost along the way and they need their questions answered. We wanna educate you. Um, we want you to understand how the different macronutrients are going to affect your body composition. And we need to be able to pivot. We need to be able to say, well, you're in a different situation. You're on vacation. You're working extra hours. How do we make it doable? How do we streamline it? I'm not going to say it's effortless, and, but it is always doable. Patients always seem to find the way once they're established in a good groove when it comes to the diet. So do any of these symptoms sound familiar? Unfortunately, I think, again, we're gonna have a kind of a yes to this one because this is what I see in my practice every day. People are tired, they're crazy, especially for sugars. They're not sleeping in a restful fashion. 10 hours, they could wake up and they're still tired. They're noticing that the weight is kind of piling up around the belly and trunk area. They're achy. They feel overwhelmed, like they just can't fit it all in. And they have GI upset. A lot of GI complaints, bloating, gas, constipation, diarrhea, heartburn. So let's move on from all of the things we know, you know, that people are presenting with and what the problems are and talk about something called weight loss resistance, which is where a lot of the problems losing weight stem from. These are some common but not obvious reasons why people seem to be doing the right thing and they just can't get where they need to go. They can't get beyond a plateau. They can't lose that weight. And these have to do with biochemical floors and they vary depending upon individuals. So let's start with the basics of our program, which really should be the basics of every good program. It's understanding your macronutrient requirements. So what are the macros? Carbs, protein, fats. And protein is the one that I find, now that I have a lot of people using apps that I review for them, is really deficient. Patients are not getting enough protein and they don't even realize it. And once we see it in grams, it's very obvious. So protein, when you think of protein, think of it as a chain of pearls. And that's the protein molecule, the entire necklace. Each of the pearls is an amino acid. And there are nine of them that are especially important because they're essential, meaning our body has to get them from food. We cannot make them from within. And if we don't get them, then we have trouble building and not just muscle, 
hair, skin, nails, even our brain chemicals are derived from these amino acids. So all of our organs need this protein. But if the brain, the kidneys, the liver aren't getting what they need, the body is going to triage and the muscle is the reservoir. So in other words, if it's not coming in through diet, we're going to use our muscle as the resource and the reservoir to supply these amino acids for these life-sustaining functions. So why, why do we find that people aren't getting enough? Because we need more as we get older. First of all, we need protein to prevent what's called age-related. As we get older, it's a little bit harder to assimilate the proteins and build muscle. And that's mostly we're doing poorly because the RDA is giving us inadequate information. 55 to 60 grams a day is not going to help you maintain tissue. It's just what's required to prevent a protein deficiency. You see the same problem with RDAs, recommended dietary allowances, for most vitamins and minerals as well. Adults need about twice the RDA, which is what the research is telling us now. An older adult actually needs more than a teenager. So think about that. You have a growing boy who's working out. We need to take in more protein than they do once we get over 40. So we see the highest deficits in our middle-aged women. And it's their low muscle, insufficient protein, and minimal strength training. So we're going to personalize your protein requirements based upon your body comp, your muscle mass, your age, and even your activity level. And what do I mean by protein efficiency? This is really the ability to get that protein into the right place. So it has to do with the quality. Does it have the nine essential aminos? And what's the bioavailability? How well can we soak it up? Can the body absorb and digest this protein? Really important. Animal protein are excellent sources. They have all nine essential amino acids, our beef, our poultry, the eggs, seafood, the dairy. It's just easier for the body to utilize. Plant protein is less available, maybe 60 to 70%. Wheat is 40%. So when you look on your box of cereal and it says 10 grams of protein, for example, only four of those grams are actually able to be utilized by the body. Plant-based protein, it's not impossible to get enough, but you're going to need to eat more. You're going to need to combine different sources to get the essential aminos in combination. And that's going to require more calories and often more carbohydrates, depending upon what plants you're choosing. It's not impossible, but it's going to take a little bit more, uh, more food, more protein containing foods in order to reach the same level. So we can't just look at grams. Source is also key. Leucine is one of those beads and it's a really important amino acid for muscle repair and replacement. It's low in plant-based foods, especially the grains. A lot of times we may recommend something like branch chain amino acids to add extra leucine, but I really like when people get their aminos from their food. And we know that this is the this, this lecture is about weight loss, but it's really hopefully anti-aging, and just health promoting. These are the points I want to get across. And a, a significant contributor to aging unfavorably is not eating enough protein. And the timing is key as well. So overnight, we're not waking up in the middle of the night. And eat. So what happens is we don't have enough protein on board over time. So the muscle becomes the reservoir, as I mentioned earlier. And what the kidneys, the liver, the brain, those are critical functions. So we're going to be breaking down muscle to supply the amino acids. And that ends if we break the fast appropriately, which means enough protein. And Americans are not doing it. Think of the typical American breakfast. It's a bagel, it's a muffin, it's coffee, maybe even cereal and fruit. But none of those contain the amount of protein we need to get out of catabolism to stop the breakdown. In the program we're using, we're gonna add a grass-fed um, beef collagen protein. It's complete aminos, and it's just a lot easier in the morning to, you know, people running out the door, it's nice to make a smoothie. So it's a weight loss lecture. Again, why am I harping on the protein? Because overall, we all want good, healthy metabolism, and what makes your metabolism low is not having enough busy tissue. And if it's slow, when it comes to weight loss, you are fighting an uphill battle. And we lose muscle as we age. So what you got away with when you were 18 and 20, your body composition is going to change if you're eating the exact same food to accumulate fat and reduce muscle. And this is one of those weight loss resistance recipes for disaster. So aging throws us a bit of a curveball, meaning we have to work harder. And I say this to a lot of my patients, the women in menopause, but it's not impossible. You just have to change what, what was working for you. Muscle loss is not written in stone. So to be metabolically healthy, again, you need enough lean body mass. I can't stress it enough. 
but it's not just about eating protein. You have to exercise. So when people say, oh, where do I start? I say, do more than you're currently doing. Anything additionally is going to be a step in the right direction. We can build muscle at any age. There's studies with 80 year olds in nursing homes and they're able to significantly increase their muscle mass compared to their baseline muscle. So we know there's hope for all of us. And this is Jack Laleen and he's always my inspiration as also he was a chiropractor, which makes him even more inspiring in my book. So after age 50, lean body mass is inversely proportional to your risk for death. What does that mean? The more muscle you have, the more likely you are to stay alive. And the less muscle you have, the increased risk of mortality. That is a really big deal. So as we age, unfortunately, the lower hormone levels are going to impact our ability to build muscle. Again, we can get ahead of it, but we have to work harder and differently. More high quality protein, meaning containing all the aminos, more exercise. Most people approach this incorrectly. Think about it. You get to 50 and you're gaining weight. So what do you do? You cut back. You cut back on your calories, which often leads to reduced instead of increased protein consumption. Consume enough at each meal is important too. If you're just having little bits throughout the day, it's not enough to reduce the catabolism. We need at least four ounces of these complete proteins per meal. And this is why we recommend meals as opposed to frequent snacking. Muscle building isn't triggered unless you have enough. And the nice thing about muscle is it's the most satiating. So if you eat it, you feel full, you feel satisfied. And a lot of patients will say to me, no, I am not full unless I eat carbs. No, you're not bloated unless you eat a lot of carbs, but you feel full temporarily, you feel stuffed, but the protein's gonna keep you steady and keep your blood sugar steady longer. So here it is. If this is all you did, this would be a huge step in the right direction. Consume enough good quality bioavailable protein. Again, when I look on those uh, chronometer app for my patients, almost nobody comes close initially. A minimum of three times a week, 30 to 40 minutes of resistance training. This is where we would like everyone to get to. And if you want to go beyond, wonderful. But this is really a nice baseline. It really is. And this is another of my Jack Lalane quotes. Exercise is king. Nutrition is queen. Together you have a kingdom. Totally hokey, but it gets the point across. Let's talk about carbs, the next macronutrient. So what are carbs? We're back to our chain of beads, our beaded necklace. I'm going to have to tell my husband to get me a pearl necklace so when I do these lectures, it, uh, it, it's easy to illustrate. So carbs are molecules consisting of linked sugars. We use them to fuel our brain and to make energy. So they're our energy. This is our energy source. Too many carbs, though, that aren't getting utilized for energy, what's going to happen? We're going to store them as fat. So what are the main sources? What are the carbs? Starches. So when I say starches, everyone thinks I'm just talking about grains, but there are starchy vegetables, the potatoes, the corn, the beef, the winter squash, carrots, pumpkin, even green peas. Think about the stuff that mostly grows underground. That's the starchy one. The non-starchy are all of the rest. These are the ones we really promote and, and recommend on our programs. They're lower in sugar, higher in fiber. So they're really I'm going to talk about a lot about how they have lower net carbs, which is favorable. And then there are the fruits. Fruits contain more sugar than vegetables, but some of them, like most of the berries, are high in fiber and low in net carbs. So what's a net carb? Net carbs are the carbs that are going into your bloodstream. How do we figure that out? The total carbs minus the fiber, fiber is a carb, is what are the net. So in other words, if the total carb is something is 15 and the fiber is 5, that means the net is 10. The reason we get to subtract the fiber, it's a freebie, is because it's indigestible, meaning the body can't break it down, so it doesn't get into your bloodstream, so it can't impact your blood sugar, it stays in your gut. So vegetables and low net carb fruits are very desirable. They don't spike your blood sugar. Those are slow acting carbs. It's tricky because when you look on a box, a box of cereal, for instance, it may say high fiber, the total carbs may be really high, so the net's high. In other words, let's say it has 35 grams of total carbs and six fiber, you still have a lot, 29 grams of carbs racing it. So you have to be able to figure that out. And if the, the app that we use, the chronometer app, does it for you. So for instance, these are the fruits that we like. The berries. A cup of raspberries has almost nine grams of fiber and over seven net carbs, which is low, just 7.2, not too bad. 
just over that. A cup of blackberries, 7.6 fiber, just over six net carbs. Strawberries, again, a little less fiber, but not so crazy with the net carbs. We're talking a cup, that's a, that's a decent serving size. You don't always have to consume a cup. Blueberries, interestingly enough, are higher. The fiber is a little higher than strawberries, but look at the net carbs, 18 grams. So I would say to patients, go for the others if you can. You're gonna get more fiber and net carbs, more bang for your buck with these. Bananas, on the other hand, and most of the tropical fruits are high, 24 grams of net carbs, triple what's in most of the berries, apple 20, pear 17.5, and figs. I had a big eye opener this summer. I do put my food on the chronometer, and I ate seven figs one day thinking, oh, they're so tiny, and I was shocked to see how much sugar I had consumed that day. So even I can be fooled, and that's why it's good to educate yourself and have these apps because they, you know, sometimes it's a bit of a wake-up call when you really write it down and log it and see what you're doing. Unfortunately, um, Americans are not even close to getting enough fiber. I think this 15 grams is even exaggerated based on what I see. Why is fiber so great? Well, it helps you poop, which is always a good thing, and that's key for detoxification. Helps with satiety, more filling. And it helps to control the blood sugar since it slows the absorption of those carbs. We have to chisel out that fiber. It takes a little longer than if you're eating straight up sugar without enough fiber. It lowers risk of heart disease. This has been proven over and over again. And it even helps to lower cholesterol because it's like a sponge that mops up and disposes of the cholesterol and toxins. It improves hormonal detoxification. It lowers the risk for pretty much every cancer and it feeds the friendly bacteria. If you're taking probiotics and you're starving them, they're not going to flourish and they're not going to grow. They will not stick around. They need that fiber from plant-based foods in order to be able to stay in your gut. So blood sugar and fiber. So basically, how carbs affect our blood sugar depends on how fast they go racing in. All carbohydrates, the beads, are broken down to simple sugar. The higher fiber ones, as I mentioned before, are digested slower, slow acting. Most breads, most cereal, many fruits, yogurts, fast acting. They are more rapidly converting to sugar, not the veggies. Higher in fiber, digest more slowly so they give insulin, which is our blood sugar lowering hormone, a much needed rest. If we don't give insulin a rest, the consequence becomes insulin resistance. And this is due to excess carbohydrate consumption over time. If you spend a lot of time on that blood sugar lower, lowering roller coaster, then what's going to happen is you're going to need a lot of insulin. It's going to work for a while until eventually the cells in our body start to become less sensitive. <laughs> the cell's inability to, to pay attention to insulin, to let it cross the gates, makes our bodies compensate by making more. So just to understand Over time, if we're constantly provoking insulin by eating too many fast-acting carbs, eventually it falls on deaf ears. And what we do to compensate is we make more. It takes more to get the job done to lower the blood sugar. And people think, big deal. So what if I make more? I don't want to be diabetic. I want to have insulin. But the opposite is true. The vast majority of diabetics are type 2, and they're making too much insulin. So the pancreas is making the insulin, but the body, the cells are not responding. And what happens when you make too much insulin? Well, this is truly a recipe for weight loss resistance because all of those extra carbs get stored around the middle, governed by insulin. It turns up the same pathway that drugs like Lipitor and the other statins shut down, insulin turns on. So it works towards cholesterol synthesis. It raises triglycerides. It affects blood pressure because it causes the kidneys to hold on to salt and fluid. How many people after going on like a binge of carby food the night before you wake up and you're so puffy in the morning, even under your eyes, this is directly related, probably salt too, but also the insulin and it blocks fat burning. It affects our cognition. Alzheimer's, Google type three diabetes and you'll read all about the impact of insulin and it promotes just about every growth factor related to cancer. This is the roller coaster diagram that I show all of my patients during their consultations and follow-ups. The dotted line is the fast-acting sugar. The the arrow is insulin. Blood sugar is going up fast. Insulin kicks in. Down you go. And the problem when you hit bottom is you don't feel so good. We just suck the gas out of your tank. So you're going to have a lot of strong cravings to get back up again. And if this has been your, you know, basically your pattern for years, eventually insulin resistance occurs. And these are the consequences. 
what contributes a diet high in fast acting carbs, imbalanced snack, not enough fiber, and certainly an imbalance of protein carb to fat. Unstable blood sugars, think of it as a roller coaster. So not only is it going to impact our body composition, it's going to impact our mood and anxiety. When you're on the way down, when you're here, what happens is the brain gets nervous and it's going to set off an alarm and go, uh oh, I'm running out of fuel. And the first responder in the body is a hormone called adrenaline. That's our fight or flight button. And the reason it responds is because part of the panic response is to spill some sugar into the bloodstream. So when the blood sugar is dropping, the quick response is to get some adrenaline. We all know how quick adrenaline kicks in. So you could just be sitting on the couch, relaxing, have your feet up and not have eaten for too long or eaten the wrong foods. And it's an hour or so later. And all of a sudden you feel anxious and stressed. Because your heart races a little. And what happens when you feel anxious and stressed? Oh, I want more sugar. So we are very much focused. This is probably the biggest part of our program is keeping your blood sugar steady and balanced. So what does our program include? Basically unlimited high fiber vegetables, limited fruits just to the lower glycemic one, ensure adequate fiber, we really stress this. We base your carbohydrate macros on your specific needs. We eliminate all the processed carbs and we will stabilize your blood sugar so you're not hangry and hungry and certainly not crazy. Let's talk about brain chemistry. This is another reason for weight loss resistance, clearly. There are brain chemicals that really dictate how we feel. And the fab four, dopamine and norepinephrine, those are called catecholamines. They help us focus. They're enter energizing to the brain. GABA is our natural Xanax, calming. Endorphins, you've heard of them with the runner's high. Those are the natural painkillers. And then there's serotonin, which is like natural Lexapro, Prozac, stabilizes our mood, cuts the cravings, and helps us relax and sleep. And these are potent. Your body has to have them. And if not, you can't win. So your willpower cannot fight low levels of neurotransmitters. Very difficult because we're looking for foods or drugs or something to replace these missing chemicals. So when you have these kind of cravings for alcohol, even caffeine, artificial sweeteners, even extremes of exercise, think neurotransmitter deficit. And the problem is, again, another catch-22, prolonged stress depletes these natural neurotransmitter production. And also back to the protein, they're derived from amino acids, which are the building block. Not enough protein, insufficient neurotransmitter production. And what happens with emotional eating? Most of my patients who are you know, overeating, it's not because they're hungry. There's totally different reasons there. Drug-like foods can eventually block the production. They give you a temporary trick into thinking you're getting the neurotransmitters, but ultimately they they trick the brain into thinking those spaces are filled so we produce even less in the long run. And these are compelling, as I said before, when mice are given a choice between cocaine and sugar, 93% of them pick the sugar. So how does the protein help? Back to neurotransmitters being made from amino acids. Protein foods contain those building blocks. So each meal needs sufficient protein to keep up with the demand. And the last macro I want to talk about are fats. Fats are not the F word. They've gotten just a bad rep, but we need good fats in our diet. And just like the essential aminos, we can't make them from scratch. We are entirely dependent upon dietary sources. They make up the outer coating of every cell. Think about that. Not only is that clothes, they get all the good stuff in the cell, but this is where all the communication happens, the hormones, the neurotransmitters. This is where the brain chemicals basically attach and do their job. And it's also where the garbage leaves and the good stuff enters. So we need these nice, fluid, flexible coatings. And if we don't have enough or we're eating the wrong fats, these are the consequences because it's such broad impact. Depression, mood, osteoporosis. Omegas are very important for bone density. Dryness, that's obvious. Dry skin, eczema, sleep difficulties due to the effects on the brain. All of the insulin resistance type symptoms because of the impact on the cell coatings, the cell membranes, and certainly due to inflammation, autoimmune disease, joint and musculoskeletal pain. So what are the good fats? We know there's good and bad fats. The omega-3 fish oils are really nice as anti-inflammatories and we need them. And most of us just do not eat enough of fatty, healthy fish in order to get what we need. So supplements are a good insurance policy, but always make sure they're GMP certified because the oceans are dirty, the fish are not clean, so you don't wanna be doing more harm than good. 
They are anti-inflammatory, they're the good mood fats, and some of the lower mercury, that's very important to take into account, high, like tuna is high in mercury, do not recommend a lot of that in my patients' diets, but instead sardines, herring, wild salmon, mackerel, trout, wild cod, anchovies. Ground flax. You know, for a minute, I just want to talk about wild versus farm salmon. Farm salmon has the omega threes, but the majority of farm salmon that are kept in a tank are fed pelleted fish that are loaded with PCBs, which are really bad toxins. So, ground flax is another source of omega threes. It's not usually able to convert into EPA DHA. Most of us don't have the machinery to do that in terms of our enzyme capacity. But flax alone has its own benefit. It helps make the, he the healthier two estrogens, which are the more favorable, favorable class of estrogen. And it also is a fiber. Saturated fats as, are not terrible fats. We just have to watch the amount so we're not favoring inflammation. So I recommend for patients to use grass-fed animal. Grass-fed animal are eating grass versus being fed, you know, genetically modified corn. We use corn to fatten up the cows, but we give them unhealthy fat, just like we use starches to fatten up America. Grasses are obviously much more favorable choice and it's what they're, nat they're naturally supposed to be eating. Consume leaner cuts of beef and balance with enough of these nutrients, the omega, the antioxidants, so that we can metabolize these fats favorably. So what are the good fats? A lot of it has to do with what you plan to do with it. A very good fat is, is extra virgin olive oil, but if you heat it to the point of smoking, you've, you've ruined it. So avocado, sesame, ghee, coconut, olive for lower heat cooking. The other ones are better, are, are suitable for high heat. You do not want to heat your flax and your chia and your hemp seeds. So you stick them in your yogurt or in your protein shake, or you can bake with them. And, it, you know, at a very lower temperature, you know, you don't really want to go too hot uh, at all. I usually don't even use much of this, occasionally a little flax for baking. But mostly I put these on top of my, my softer foods, <laughs> like yogurts, or yeah, I make acai bowls and I mix them in there. In salads, we want first cold pressed olive oil. First cold pressed, you can see the word cold pressed on a lot of olive oils. But you really want the first because when they squeeze the olive, the most antioxidants is going to be in the first pressing. Each additional pressing is going to make it a little more dilute, not contain the same amount of antioxidants, which are really great for improving our quality of our cholesterol, making the particles less atherogenic, big, big and fluffy instead of small and sticky. There are nut oils. And then mineral amounts. I don't really love the safflower sunflower in excess, but it's hard to hide from them. They're in a lot of the you know, healthier foods. Expeller pressed makes them less likely to be damaged, hydrogenated. And I, I recommend not to buy, you know, Costco bottles this big because every time you open it, you're oxidizing. So you want to also keep them in a, you know, in the cupboard, cool, dark place. The bad fats, well, pretty obvious. Not everybody knows that the fat in microwave popcorn when they add the butter is so terrible. A lot of the shortenings, the non-dairy creamers, without question, these are linked to heart disease, cancer, and lower good cholesterol levels margarine, vegetable oils, um, they, they can be heated, some of them, but they're still terrible oils and most of them get hydrogenated pretty easily. So I, I say just steer clear of them 100%. And conventional animal fats are lower in arachidonic acid. So as we mentioned before, so we wanna make sure by conventional, I'm saying ones that are fed the corn instead of the grass fed, they can be inflammatory. And I should go back. Some of the vegetable oils, there are some of the more natural butters now that have some of these vegetable oils that they go to great lengths to make sure that they are expeller pressed, but they still should be just a small part of your diet. What do the healthy fats do for us? Anti-inflammatory, synthesized hormone, vitamin D. Brain is the fattest organ in our body. 60% fat. We need to feed it the right fats. Again, we can't make some of these some from scratch. So whatever you take in in your diet is what you're going to be, you know, synthesizing your important organs from. Affects the texture of our hair, our skin, our nails. Makes our bones stronger. Improves insulin sensitivity. Lowers triglycerides. So now we're done with our macros. Let's talk about another reason for weight loss: cravings, trigger foods. You ever notice? And I have patients tell me this all the time. Don't even put this particular food, no bread, in my program, because if I have one slice, I'm off to the races. 
one bite is just going to trigger some type of compelling craving. And these are often related to what we call food intolerances, not the same as your typical food allergies. Food allergies, we think about shellfish, peanuts, the, the obvious, the highs, you know, anaphylaxis. These are more subtle. A lot of times they're unrecognizable. We don't realize that we have them until we really go and do some detective work, which I'm going to talk about. But these are what I call the walking wounded. And almost everyone that presents to me has several of these symptoms and don't see how they're connected to foods. And the weird thing about these food intolerances, food sensitivities, is that they're often the foods that we love most. Why would that be? Why would it be we, cow's milk and sugar, America's favorites? Why would we eat what hurts? Why would we crave foods that are damaging? Because when we eat these foods along with sugar, it triggers a light inflammation, which causes an inflammatory response. And the endorphins are there to protect us. There are powerful painkillers. And we've even been able to find these particular metabolites called gluteomorphs and caseomorphs. We, could, we can measure them in urine and even in blood. Morphs. Casein mean cow's milk, gluten. Everyone knows that's wheat, rye, and barley, gluteomorphs. These are similar to opiates. And for people who are sensitized to these, we can find these metabolites in their urine. And what happens is they get very addicted, morphine, opiate. And when we take the people off them, initially, they really don't feel well. They, they have withdrawal symptoms, but they don't last long. And we work on blood sugar and we work on, you know, dealing with neurotransmitters. So we blunt the, the negative part of this in our patients so that they can get through it. Because if they continue to eat it, these are all the consequences. All the things that we've been talking about here that we're trying to avoid, a lot of the, those kind of walking wounded symptoms. So often just removing the foods from our diet, these food sensitivities, helps patients. I had one patient who did a three-week weight loss program and was able to get off allergy meds that she had been using since she was a child because we're giving the immune system a rest. You know, it's not being so overloaded. So some of the environmental allergies that are mediated by completely different pathways, the IgE, tend to be more tolerated. And what happens, this is a clue, that a lot of people will eat you know, not much during the day and binge on these types of foods at night. What happens is they sleep off their allergic reactions and they feel hungover in the morning. And I'm sure some of you can relate to this without alcohol. Um, I'm sure some of you can relate to it with alcohol too, but we're talking about just related so best way to test for food intolerances, well, there's some very advanced testing, and I do it in my practice. A lot of patients really want to see all the foods they might be intolerant towards. But what I do is I pick the big ticket item in most people's diet, which are gluten and dairy, and we remove them for four weeks. And obviously, oops, if you have celiac, not just four weeks, but as part of our program, our one-month program, we are removing the gluten. So basically, let's talk about um, what you've all been here, you know, what you've all signed on to hear about with this webinar is our Smart Start Weight Loss Program. So I and Jillian are going to help you by establishing your macronutrient needs. We're going to set you up on the chronometer app so we can monitor you closely. And we're going to be very targeted in your macronutrient assessment based on in-body analysis or measurements you can do at home and some other information about you specifically. And we are going to guide you. We're gonna help you build a flexible menu that you know, has multiple uses in different, in different arenas. You're going on vacation, you're eating out, we're gonna help you make the right choices. There's gonna be a Facebook group, which is closed just to members of the program where we're gonna you know, be available to answer your questions and also supply a lot of good research and, and information to motivate you throughout the program. There's going to be a lot of information about nutrition and fitness, and you're going to be able to check in specifically once a week. So you feel supported. We're going to supply recipes and handouts and the smoothie powder comes with the program. So you have an extra source of protein. And I, you know, I really hope that those of you who are on the fence are convinced that this is, you know, going to be a great program for you. But if not, I hope that you got something out of this and that we were able to you know, really guide you as to how to, you know, think about eating a healthier diet. Thanks so much for everything. And One, 
As Dr. Adre described, we are going to work with you on the weight loss that is science-based. And uh, most of all, it's based on you. So it's not some kind of magical templated program that will tell you, oh, like you all do the same thing. It will be based on your unique features, on perfectly on who you are, based on your body composition, based on your uh, blood work, based on your unique uh, features. And this way we can almost precisely say how much of what macronutrient you should be eating, each and every one of you, for your goals, which is going to be this time weight loss in a healthy fashion. Meaning we don't want to have any deficiencies, we don't want to have any inflammation, and we don't want to have any uh, harm done by weight loss. We want to uh, for that to be very healthy experience for you, so you can come out with this with better habits and with sustainable path for further weight loss, unless, of course, uh, your goal is very small, and then you will come out after uh, 21 days with uh, all issues resolved. 28 days. <clears throat> <laughs> um, and uh, we're going to have a Facebook group that will be there just for you, where you can go every day and ask questions and get some information, education, get support, and work with others who are doing the same thing as you. So it's very uh, close society, community of people who have the same and common goal. And in our experience, it's very, very, very helpful to do that. Because when you have other people around you who are doing the same thing and you see them doing that, it's way easier to do it because, uh, you know, no man is an island. And when we are in a kind of vacuum, it's way harder to do those things. When you have support from others or going through the same journey, it is way easier. And I even see it sometimes when I work with people one on one, they want to be in a group of people who do the similar things. <clears throat> And so I encourage you to look into that and uh, to see if that is going to be beneficial for you. Do you think that approach that is custom based on you will help you? Do you think that community will help you? Do you think that constant support on our part will help you? If the answer is yes, I think that you should really uh, consider joining us. And uh, I believe you will have as much success as our uh, clients. And I believe I saw some people who worked with us in the past on this, and we are very, very successful. So um, it's great to see people who are coming back for the same thing. Um, back to you. So just, just a little housekeeping. <clears throat> We're kind of under the gun here because between the holidays and everybody wanting to get started in early January, we need to get some data from those of you who want to sign up. So either call Melanie um, at, you know, the office number, most of you, but for those of you who don't, it's 732-308-3030. Um, I think you can all still, can they still see my slides? No. Or you can email her at it's frontdesknj at the nutritional wellness center.com. Front desk. NJ at the nutritional wellness center.com. Let Melanie know you want in in the program. And then we're going to need you to either come in for an in body or if that's kind of cutting it close, then um, we're going to send you uh, a little instructions on how to do certain measurements. And from that, Julian will be able to calculate the macros. All you need is a tape measure, it's not very labor intensive, it'll take you two minutes. And it's pretty precise, believe it or not, in terms of calculating the body mass, percent body fat. And that's what we really need to get started with the macros. And we really need that. Today's the 21st. You know, again, holiday. If we could get that into us by Friday, and that, that would be really helpful because Julian's going to need about a week to work because we have a bunch of people signing up. So we want to make sure. Oh, thanks, Julian. So we want to make sure he's the brains behind the uh communication so obviously not me i'm too old that little 10 year difference or a little more made all the difference in the world but anyway we want to get started so we can have your measurements together so you can right after the holidays get moving and one 
Um, yeah, Melanie will talk to you about what flavor shake you want also, because that's going to be a big help just to kind of augment your protein and you can see that that's really a big part of it. So great. Thanks everybody for sticking around. I know it's been almost an hour and everybody's busy and tired and getting ready for the holidays. So I really appreciate it. I hope you'll, I hope you join us. I think that there's a lot to be gained from this. It's a good program. We've been working with a lot of patients together and we've had some great success. People feel good. They look good. Um, and they get more motivated and they're getting a lot of information back between, you know, our feedback and also just using the app to see, you know, how, what they're doing is translating. So you know, I think everyone's going to be happy and we really look forward to hearing from you. And it's nice seeing you guys. Hi, Beth. <laughs> okay. Bye, everybody. Have a great night.